So here's hoping that you have been watching my videos on the topic of marine radar. If not, then the links to those videos have been put in the description section below. Please watch those videos because uh, this video uh, takes you into a section of the radar, uh, which is the automatic radar plotting aids, uh, which are also types of radars and the acronym or the short form of this is ARPAS. So today we'll be talking about ARPAS and this is an introduction video where I'll be talking about a little bit about the history of the development of the ARPA and how the ARPA uh, acquires the targets, both manual and automatic acquisition. I'll be talking about track storage. I'll be talking about certain important elements of the performance standards, as well as the setting up procedures of the ARPA. So let's get started. Uh, ARPA is simply a computer system which is attached to a marine radar and it can automatically measure the ranges and bearings to selected targets or those targets within specific defined areas. From a series of ranges and bearings, a track history can be formed, which will enable the calculation of true track and speed, as well as the CPA and TCPA to the targets. CPA is of course the closest point of approach and TCPA stands for time to the closest point of approach. Uh, these calculations, uh, such as the calculation of true track, speed, CPA and TCPA, was previously done manually by the operator using a radar plotting sheet before the ARPAs were provided. So an ARPA must provide a manual acquisition facility. That means you should be able to manually track and acquire the targets and it may also provide an automatic acquisition facility. The performance standards of the ARPA are laid down by the IMO and it covers the functionality and accuracy of ARPA and I'll be discussing some of its essential elements as well. And the ARPAs are capable of uh, tracking a number of targets and we'll talk about that as well. But before I go into the essential elements of the ARPA or the performance standards of the essential elements of the ARPA, let me give you a brief history of how the ARPA came about. Uh, the basis of ARPA was the Argo merchant disaster in uh, 1976 where Argo Merchant was actually a tanker that grounded off the coast of America or USA and it caused massive pollution over a rich fishing ground. Environmental groups then pressured the US Congress during an election year to respond to this disaster. In response to the disaster, the US Congress actually passed the uh, Port and Tanker Act of 1978 which covered safety standards on tankers of 20,000 deadweight and above. Uh, by June 1979, such tankers entering U.S. waters were to have dual radar, collision avoidance systems, and long-range navigational aids. By 1st July 1982, it was mandatory to have a collision avoidance system on all tankers over 10,000 tons. The Americans were always very keen on collision avoidance systems, but early equipment was quite unreliable and there were no performance standards associated with it. Australia, of course, adopted the IMO resolution into this marine orders on the 1st of September 1984 and an ARPA were fitted to an Australian ship had to meet the IMO performance standards as enforced by the Australian Maritime Safety Authority, uh, that is AMSA. The marine notice, uh, which was a reflection of the IMO performance orders or IMO performance standards, provided the fitting schedule for ARPA onto Australian ships and also stated that the requirement that all operators must be properly trained in its use and limitations. Required on all ships over 10,000 tonnage constructed on or after the 1st September 1984, it is possible, however, to get an exemption from carrying ARPA, particularly if the vessel is only engaged in coasting trade. I now move on to some of the essential elements of the performance standards. So the performance standards says that the minimum screen diameter for the ARPA should be about 340 millimeters. It should have a raster scan display only. It should be able to manually acquire at least 10 targets and uh, automatically acquire 20 targets if fitted. Uh, the representation of the presentation should have a true and relative vector option. The vector length should be adjustable by the operator. The ARPA should also have a north up or a course up presentation mode available in it. It should also provide the course uh, speed CPA TCPA range and bearing on any tracked target which are important information of course uh, regarding the target. 
the full accuracy of fragged target data should be available after three minutes for a target at eight miles and preliminary data should be available after one minute. A full range of operator alarms and alerts should be fitted, which includes collision threat, lost target and guard zone or minimum range. It should also have a trial maneuver facility fitted in it and a past track history must be available on all tracked targets. The basic principles of target acquisition in an ARPA is that targets are tracked by searching for targets within a range bearing matrix and once found automatically extracting the range and bearing. From a series of range and bearings, a track history is built up and from that vector addition and calculation can find the necessary data of course, speed, CPA and TCP. CPA and TCP, range and bearing information is always the first data available on any tracked target. For a target to appear in the range bearing cell, it must of course pass the detection threshold limits. I'll show you all that in the subsequent slides and what I mean by detection threshold limits. And also I'll talk about pulse to pulse comparison, which is used to ensure that only consistent targets are placed in the switch registers. So what happens in pulse to pulse comparison, as you see on your screen here, a normal target can be hit by 15 pulses each antenna rotation. An ARPA will typically use a ratio of five returns to 15 pulses before writing a target into the final switch register called the hit register or hit matrix. This process is shown on your screen right now. When acquiring a target, the operator uses a joystick or a tracker ball to place a marker over the desired target. The tracker ball or joystick is also connected to an acquisition window which is placed around the target's position in the range and bearing memory cell. The ARPA actually converts the raw radar echo to a digital signal which can then be stored and used for calculation. The digital signal defines the target range and bearing. For a raw radar echo to be converted, it must have a signal strength above a detection threshold. Only consistent echoes will be stored in the display and tracking memory. Here, the process of digital conversion is shown. Targets are detected automatically by using a correlation based on consecutive antenna rotations called scan to scan comparison. Typically, if a target appears in the same window of a range bearing cells for five out of 10 antenna rotations, a track is generated. After 15 rotations, the track is confirmed and a target vector is generated. Here you can see a pulse to pulse comparison is being shown and how the scanner rotation uh, using the pulse to pulse comparison detects not only big targets in the vicinity, but also small targets. Only a consistently appearing target will then be registered, its history is stored and then displayed on the radar screen. With an antenna rotation of 24 RPM, a scan is completed every 2.5 seconds. So it will take about 38 seconds to generate the confirmed vector. The accuracy of the track and vector would improve as the tracking period increases. Range and bearing information would be extracted every scan and hence updated at 2.5 second intervals. Thus, the calculated track is thus based on the ranges and bearings and as the tracking time increases, history of past movement and target intensifies. The raw ranges and bearings are stored and are smoothed out to limit the jitter in the target vector. This smoothing out period will depend on the range of the target from the antenna but is usually one to three minutes. Ranges and bearings smoothed over a short and long interval. Ranges and bearing observations are extracted at every 2.5 second intervals. Operator selects the vector length as required. Minimum period for smoothing is about 38 seconds for a confirmed track and ideal period is approximately about three minutes. Vectors are also a requirement of the performance standards. The vectors provide a graphical reference for the operator to determine risk of collision and traffic flow. With a true vector, presentation, own ship also has a vector. The CP and TCP information is available from the relative vector and course and speed from the true vector. Both vector types should be used, but be aware there is likely more error in the true vector. Vector length is operator selectable. Relative vectors are good for collision avoidance evaluation, 
and are least likely to be affected by coarse and speed input error. True vectors give a good indication of the flow of traffic around own ship, but coarse and speed input error will affect the accuracy of the true vector. Track storage. Track history is stored to determine the vectors and can be either a relative or true storage. The most popular technique is to use a true track storage system. Both storage systems are shown on your screen right now. With a relative track storage, the following points can be made. Smooth relative track is stored and used for the display of the relative vector. True course a true vector is calculated from stored relative track plus input of own ship course and speed. Any error in heading or speed will cause an error in the true vector only. In true track storage systems, which are now the most common, the following features can be seen. A smooth true track is stored and it is the relative vector which is calculated. Input of course and speed is applied twice for vector calculation. A constant error in speed will cause an error in the true vector only, just like a relative storage. A rapidly changing log error within the time limit of the smoothing period can cause a changing error in the relative vector. An error in the relative vector will cause errors in calculated CPA and TCPA information which is significantly or which will significantly limit the use of the ARPA for collision avoidance. Here on your screen, I have just put a summary of the difference between the relative track storage and true track storage if you need notes for exam purposes. You can pause the screen here and note down the differences between the relative track storage and the true track storage. In the manual acquisition mode, the operator positions the cursor marker using a joystick or tracker ball over the position on the screen display where the target is and uses the manual acquisition function. I will just explain the function first and then in the next slide I will show you why by animations what happens in the manual acquisition function. If the target is moving fast, one should place the cursor ahead of and in the direction of travel of the target. Manual acquisition places a tracking window over the cells where the target is. This window gets progressively smaller in size as more range and bearing information is extracted and the ARPA begins to build up a history of the target movement. If two targets are close together, a technique to minimize the risk of having two targets in the tracking window is to acquire one target first and let the window come down smaller around that target before attempting to acquire the second target. Let me show you how. So you can see here target window closes on target with more information but then comes another target. They are very closely placed. So make sure that you target or you rather acquire one target first and let the window come down smaller around the target before attempting to acquire the second one. The advantages of manual acquisition, of course, the operator can control the number of targets. The operator can distinguish between land, rain, sea, etc. and the ship targets. And the operator by the proper use of trails will be able to distinguish between the targets. Talking about automatic acquisition, it is possible for the operator to select areas around the ship which can automatically detect and acquire track targets. The guard zones or areas are drawn by on the PPI or the plan position indicator by the operator and then auto acquisition facility is switched on. Any target entering these zones or areas will be detected and automatically tracked and alarm will sound to indicate detection. Targets outside the areas will not be acquired. There are two types of automatic acquisition, the global area and the zonal area. 
In the global area, it uses a footprint area around the ship, which can be defined by a range ahead, range to starboard and port, and a minimum acquisition range. The minimum acquisition range is to stop the display acquiring C clutter. This type of acquisition area is available on NOR control RPAS. In zonal area, it uses two guard rings or zones at the required ranges. The zones can be set at different ranges and be defined as whole or segments of a ring. Normally, the zones will be fixed with the heading marker and as the ship swings, so does the zones. You can see it's on the left side of the diagram is the zonal area shown. The right side is the global one. It must be remembered that all targets in the acquisition zone will be acquired as a track if they pass the threshold detection and scan to scan correlation test. Careful use of the sensitivity time control and rain clutter controls is required to prevent the acquisition of unwanted C and precipitation tracks. In the final slide, I'll just talk about the ARPA setting up procedures. So naturally when you're setting up the ARPA, make sure that you set up the primary radar controls. What are the primary radar controls? Please watch my video on radar, but I'll quickly tell you, go take you through that. It's the on off standby switch, the brilliant switch, the gain switch, the tuning switch and the C and the rain clutter switch. Input the heading in the ARPA. Sometimes, of course, it is automatically input through the gyro, but make sure the input is there. The input, the speed, either the log speed or the manually you can operate it or GPS speed should be feeding into it. Uh, select the presentation, whether you want to set up a north up display, course up, head up, depends on your preference as an operator. Select the motion, whether you want relative motion, true motion, uh, select the vector and vector length, whether you want relative vector or true vector. Input the collision threat limits, that is input uh, what kind of a CPA, minimum CPA you want, minimum TCPA you want, uh, how uh, close the other vessel should come to your vessel before uh, an alarm should be triggered. Ensure that the trails are switched on. So using the trails, you can actually track the history of the movement of the target Input the collision threat limits, acquire the targets. Uh, I would advise you manually acquiring the targets because then, uh, like I discussed before, uh, automatic targets sometimes acquire targets which are not important. They acquire land, they acquire recons, boys, creates a lot of confusion. But then again, I leave it to you. Whatever is your preference, whatever you're comfortable with, uh, please set up the radar or the ARPA accordingly. You should remember the overall aim here is to keep your ship safe. Safety of navigation is the most important. And as long as you are keeping the ship safe, that should be good enough. Uh, but remember, always supplement the uh, radar or the ARPA navigation along with visual navigation. Don't forget to visually look out uh, of the bridge windows as well to make sure that the information you are processing through the ARPA is also corresponding uh, through your visual senses. All right, I'll stop here now, guys. All the best with your studies. I'll see you soon with my next video. Bye.